I want to start the interview with Ms. Sev here by first of all congratulating you because I understand that you just won Mr. Congeniality 2019. Tell us a bit about that. Thank you very much. Um, I was competing in a competition here in Brisbane called Drag Royale. It's our largest and most intense competition, uh, run over the course of 12 weeks uh, with a different theme sprung on us every week and a huge pool of performers. Um, over the course of that show, I did all manner of ridiculous things for other people's entertainment. Um, and there's a thread that runs through a lot of the work I do. I always bring an element of fetishism, BDSM into my performance. Um, and over the course of the show, although I didn't make it through to the finale, I, oh. I was eliminated, I think, three weeks prior. Technically not eliminated. I had to withdraw due to health issues. So by default. Um, but my peers, and the producers and my fellow performers um, voted for me and quite unanimously, which was incredibly overwhelming and honoring um, as their Mr. Congeniality for Queensland. So I, uh, I've always joked that I would like to find a way just to turn sort of crying on stage into an effective performance art and they took that choice completely away from me oh. and I bawled my eyes out on stage at the Wickham, um, and I've never felt so uh, warmly welcomed by my queer community. Just um, appreciated for the very different, but uh, you know, clearly accepted things that I do. But you are a, a drag king, yes? So tell us a little bit about that. I mean, I'm sure this all sort of goes together. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been performing as a drag king now for coming up on two years. I'd been a cabaret and burlesque performer for a decade before that. Um, I always felt like I was maybe a little too weird for that scene. <laughs> um, at Halloween, I do fine, but the rest of the year, people are not quite as entertained by my, my bizarreness. But within the, within the local LGBTQI community, I found a very open willingness to accept not only the, the fetishy elements that I brought in, but also the alternative and the weird and the challenging and the emotional. Um, I like to tackle difficult subjects in a way that makes people think and usually laugh at the same time. And that has found its, I, I found a home for that in drag. Oh. Um, and also finally a way to express my long held beard and penis envy. Uh, <laughs> but let, let's loop back to the beginning. You, you were born in Hong Kong, yes? Yes. And your family moved often around the world. So tell us about that. What was going on there? So my family ended up in Hong Kong by accident, as so often seems to be the way with the serendipitous nature of my life. Uh, my grandfather was an Australian journalist and was traveling through Hong Kong on his way to Vietnam when his health became so severe that my family were forced to stay in Hong Kong and seek medical help. And some of the ailments that he had, including quite severe asthma, turned out to be a lot better in that humid climate. Um, so he just stayed for 30 years oh my gosh. Um, and raised my mother there. And then I was born there as well. My father was in the Navy and my mother was working in Hong Kong as a journalist and they met together. and. My, my English military father, he then kind of picked us up and scooped us off around the world as well. My Australian grandfather then ended up moving to San Francisco um, with his second wife, a Hong Kong Chinese woman that was uh, under a lot of scrutiny by the government at the time for her activities that may have been a little anti-establishment. Oh. So my, um, my grandfather married her and they moved to San Francisco together and then spent the next 10 years systematically moving out members of her family to um, get them out of mainland China and into a community where they'd be accepted and welcome. Where, where all else did your family go? <laughs> all over the place. So uh, obviously we have got, we've got a large community of my family here in Australia, but I also have family scattered around Asia and around Europe, a uh, family in Holland, Germany, um, yeah. Okay. So 
But your circumstances afforded you a breadth of diversity and, and you, you learned quite a lot growing up. So tell us about that. How did that affect you? I have had the ultimate privilege of being able to travel so much and experience mm -hmm. short amounts of time living in areas rather than just passing through them. Um, when I was 13, I had the opportunity to live in San Francisco with my grandfather for a year. And <coughs> I'm certain I would not be the person that I am today if I hadn't have spent time not only living with the Chinese side of my family, but also exploring San Francisco. Uh, and as a young kind of weird alternative kid, San Francisco was the place to learn about myself. Um, my most visceral and prominent memory. I was there when I was 13 and I am my grandfather who is not, not the greatest <laughs> family man. Very fascinating and incredible writer and we, we adore him as an eccentric gonzo journalist but when it came to sort of being a sensible adult it, it wasn't really his forte. So 13 year old me, I've spent the day wandering around Berkeley all on my own <laughs> and then head down to, um, to the waterfront in main central San Francisco. I'm hanging out at the piers and um, not great to say, but I was sitting there having a cigarette, sitting on a wall and um, a uh, group of guys walk past all in leather gear. Mm -hmm. All of them in shining boots and vests and straps, and I was enthralled. And they were handing out flyers, and they were doing community work. They were actually out handing out um, condom and lube packets and handing out flyers and talking to people in the general community. It was getting towards evening, and it was obviously a bit of a party night, and they were out doing community outreach. And as the youngest and most awkward goth um, in the vicinity, said, I said something incredibly cheesy like, I love your boots! <laughs> and ended up having the most fascinating like half hour long conversation with this large group of people who just took the time to talk to me and very appropriately for my age group, you know, I asked what it was all about, whether they were a club and they were quite vague about the, <laughs> uh, the specifics, but they did take the time to you know, acknowledge that I was obviously interested and ask me you know, about myself. And I was already uh, aware of my queerness at that age. And I told them that I'd, I'd already come out as um, bisexual to my family. And um, I just, I remember this moment of kinship where they knew where I was going to be in uh, five years. They absolutely uh, knew that I was on that path already. Um, and I just remember them being so warm and welcoming. And I remember being really inspired by them taking the time to engage with the general public and their visibility. And having grown up around some military people and traveled around as much as I've experienced diversity, I've always had the opportunity, unfortunately, to experience prejudice and discrimination as well. Sure. Um, and to see people just flying in the face of potential consequence in the most public way ignited something in me. And even if I hadn't turned out to be a, a fetishist and a leather woman and into BDSM, I definitely feel like I, I still would have followed that need for community engagement thanks to their influence. But you mentioned you, you came out as bisexual very young. How mm. did your family react to that? Uh, there are two sides to that story. Um, pretty much split straight down the middle. My, my mother is incredibly accepting, um, beyond accepting. I would say she's my best example of what an ally looks like. She has two daughters and both of them are queer. Oh. And she has never done anything to make any, uh, either of us doubt that we are 100% loved and respected um, for who we are. Uh, I, I have this joke I used to tell in one of my stand-up sets until my mum started coming to my shows and she, start, she writes a blog, she started writing rebuttals. She's a lot wittier than I am, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I used to joke that you never get to come out 
just once, you know, like uh, even when I came out to my family um, as bisexual and my mum reacted great and my dad reacted awkward. Um, a year later, I really thought, actually, I think I'm probably a lesbian. Mum, I'm a lesbian. She's like, yeah, you know, it's all still cool. A couple of years later, I'm like, oh, that wasn't quite right either. No, I'm definitely bisexual, <laughs> um, but I think I might be polyamorous. Like, okay, well, that seems complicated, and I'm, it's not going to make your life easier, but I support you wholeheartedly, and that's great. Oh, mum, by the way, <laughs> I now run a fetish club. You're probably going to see <laughs> that happening, so you should know about that. I was coming out to her constantly, and never once has she batted an eyelid. No, never once. Fascinating. My, my father, on the other hand, um, his response was to take about a year to even mention it again. And then it was to make awkward jokes about attractive women kind of in public or in the media and that maybe we have the same taste. So like he was trying clearly, but was very unequipped. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about your, your early kink exploration because you liked damsel in distress play, superhero <laughs> play, Talk with us about that. Oh, absolutely. So ch childhood me, um, yeah, I was, I was absolutely drawn to it. Now, both of my parents worked in incredibly long hours, and often, you know, my father was away for long periods of time. Mother was a journalist traveling to London all the time. So I spent quite a lot of time with a childminder who had a number of foster children who were mostly boisterous boys slightly older than me. And we would hang out afternoons and we'd watch cartoons and... I, I definitely had a, a vibe for that damsel in distress motif that is so often uh, repeated. And hanging out with these, these boisterous boys, it didn't take long for the things that I enjoyed in TV to become part of our play uh, as well. Uh. So, you know, from the age of six, seven, we were playing tie-up games. I remember getting tied up and put in the cupboard under the stairs for a few hours and thinking it was the best game ever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yet strangely knew that that was probably not the kind of thing I should tell my mother about. <laughs> um, and yet the, the superhero fantasy was definitely the thing. Like, I've always had an affinity for the bad guy. Uh -huh. Mostly because the bad guy gets walloped a bunch, I think. <laughs> and obviously, like, aesthetically, I, I took it a little much too, too much to heart. But... I love the playful relationship between villains and heroes when I was a young person. I love that it wasn't just about defeating the bad guy and it being done. It was about this playful dynamic, a symbiosis where, you know, mm. one needs the other. And, they play. and I just remember being captivated by that and thinking more about how much I would love to become a supervillain and have a superhero to battle constantly than I ever thought about, like, being a young girl thinking about my wedding. Like, that never happened mm. at all. I wanted my, my toxic superpowers uh. and then a and then a superhero to come and be my nemesis like i thought that was that was the dream well you mentioned when we were preparing for this you used the phraseology expression without fear talk with us about that what did you mean by that i think living and expressing myself without fear is a it's a place that I came to after a, a complicated and, and, you know, sometimes difficult childhood where fear was always, um, always looming. It was always problems, whether it was, you know, how my family was getting in trouble and being pursued by you know, con communist regimes or how my, um, my father was, um, you know, very angry and aggressive and um, man who used intimidation. My childhood was spent very much discovering a rich inner world, but not feeling entirely safe, showing people who I was. You know, I was very bookish, I was very contained. And something started unraveling in me really early on where I realized that I was never going to be known and I, I felt very detached from people and I was never going to be known, I was never going to truly know people unless I overcame the sense of fear of needing to protect myself. Maybe something about me was wrong. Maybe the things that I felt weren't normal. And I, when you're a young, queer, weird kid, it's very easy to feel like you're wrong and not normal and that there isn't a place where you can be fearless. 
Um, and I realized that it, it's not a place. It's a, it's a perspective. It's an outlook. Uh -huh. And if I could walk through the world without fear, if I could show people that I was queer and comfortable, if I could show people that I was kinky and comfortable, if I could show people that um, I'm unashamedly me, mm -hmm. that they would have people to look to as well. They, they would know that they didn't have to live with fear. Well, that probably brings you to the cognizance that you had when you were a young person, because you told me that you used to go to parties and bring condoms. And, and uh, what, I, tell us more about that, because I, the concept of a young person doing that is very strong, I think. Mm, so from the age of 14, roundabout, that became pretty much my, I felt like that was my place in my, in my local, um, like amongst my school friends and my community. Um, I was growing up at the time in a place called Hastings in England and at the time it had the highest teenage pregnancy rates in all of Europe. <laughs> I was a very aware young person, I was a very sexual young person, so I knew it was something that mattered to me. Okay. And I knew that most of my peers and my school friends, particularly I went to an all-girls school, didn't have the greatest sex ed. I knew mm -hmm. that so many people my age and up were drinking, partying, having sex. They didn't have education, they didn't have protection. And I was deep, deeply moved to just, just that small thing. I, I would go to a local health service in, my, young, in my, my town, the youth development service. They had a sexual health clinic that saw young people and I would go there. I would tell them that I was going out for the weekend, I'd be socializing and I'd get a big bag of free condoms and I'd fill my handbag with them. And if I saw anybody even like getting, getting close to somebody at a party, I'm just like the condom fairy. I was just like, you have a condom, you have a condom. And I started giving them away like lollies. <clears throat> and there was, a few, there was a few reasons behind that. Um, one of them was that I wasn't ashamed to be seen going into the sexual health clinic because I felt informed and confident and safe. And a lot of young people probably didn't. Um, I was very lucky. My mum's very communicative. And my mum's best friend, my honorary uncle, Fergus, he had been incredibly open to me in talking about the importance of barrier protection, sexual health. He um, unfortunately passed away just a few years after that uh, with complications from HIV. And we'd known that he'd been living with his struggle for a while. And so I've got Fergus in my ear on one hand, just like this is something that's important to understand from the youngest age that you've you know, it's, it's never a good time to forget about the importance of protecting you and your community. And on the other hand, I had girls that I was at school with, 14-year-olds, dropping out of school because they were pregnant. Mm. And it seemed like there was a simple solution <laughs> to this problem, and that was education and communication. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the prettiest and I wasn't the coolest and I was awkward and there weren't that many people who were out at my age either. Um, teenage boys are a nightmare. <laughs> um, so I just, um, yeah, I just carried around bag of condoms everywhere I went. The bars that I was sneaking into underage and the parties I was going to. And yeah, I would get a bowl out of the kitchen, put bowls of condoms on people's coffee tables, not even ask them, just do it. Oh and, my gosh. Um, and it, it just kind of became my niche. So when I moved out to Australia when I was 15, I kept, I kept doing this. So just Australian school kids I found I had a weird cultural adjustment coming over here just because it felt um, the high school years run a little bit differently. And when I left England, I kind of felt like I was coming to the end of my schooling. I was ready to go to college. Then I came out to Australia and they're like, enjoy grade 11 and 12. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I was being put down back into uniformed kids zone. Um, and I noticed that there was just a, a difference in the way that young people age 15, 16 in Australia had felt to the young people in my hometown Hastings, one that was very sex, drugs and alcohol fueled. And here very few of my peers felt like they'd kind of crossed that barrier yet. And it was their older brothers and sisters and peers who were kind of getting into that stage. So all of a sudden I'm the person nobody knows. I had shaved my head. I was wearing big men's goth boots to school um, and carrying around bags of condoms and I had the weird English accent. And it was not a good way to get popular. <laughs> um, but it was a great way to start conversations with people. 
Um, and by the end of that two years, I remember being absolutely overwhelmed. Like my, my school here in Queensland, our formal wouldn't allow same-sex couples. Uh. So myself and my <laughs> gay best friend, we went together and protest. We were very sparkly. And at that event, so many of our peers, of our, our school friends, chose that time to come out, oh, to wow. be visible, wow. to give us community, joined us at our tables. Um, I remember thinking like, you know, it wasn't a great way to be cool, but being visible really, really means something to people and they're giving it back to me and showing in solidarity. And because my life is a constant back and forward, a year after that, I'm back in England. <laughs> Um, uh, graduated at 17, instead of going to school, he's got on a plane, flew, flew straight to England, because I knew where the party was at. <laughs> um, and the first job that I got was I walked into that youth development service, that sexual health clinic, where I used to go and get all those condoms as a, as a young person, said, hey, I'm basically already doing this job. I would like you to pay me now. Um, and they, they gave me a job. And I was running that project within a year. So, um, yeah, that's I then, an interesting career choice. Yeah, I, yeah. Then, I then ran a young person sexual health clinic and got funding from the British government to start a new project called GLSEN, which was the Gay, yeah. Lesbian, Youth Social Support Network. Um, and I ran that out of my hometown in England for a number of years. But you said your age was mm. really what benefited you in that. Absolutely. Um, I was the youngest youth worker, not only in my centre, but at, at one point, I think just as I finished my qualifications, so I did my NVQ on the job in youth work, and just as I got my qualification, I think I was just 18 and a half, and it made me the youngest qualified youth worker in all of England at the time. And I, I was very lucky that platform allowed me to do some incredible work. I ended up um, giving speeches at conferences for other youth workers, training them in how to deal with queer young people, how to make services more accessible, how to reach out in their communities, um, both for LGBTQI young people and for young people with mental health concerns. They were really my focuses in training other youth workers. And it was a thing, like youth workers tend to range from mid-20s, you know, up until 50s, 60s. Sure. Um, and the older a youth worker gets, obviously the more experience they have, and so often the harder young people find to talk to them. Uh, to open up to them. Uh, I was so closely connected by generation to some of the young people I was supporting. In fact, my project, one of the other projects I ended up getting funding for off the back of it, a uh, Pulse project, which unified local services like support for um, homelessness and addiction and brought them all into central hubs that would allow young people to access all services from a central hub. Um, that project looked after people age 15 to 25. And so I was running this as an 18-year-old slap bank in the middle of my own demographic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, sometimes a little intimidated by trying to be a, a stable and sensible support person for somebody you know, in their mid-20s when I felt yeah. like I'd barely started living my life yet. Um, but what I knew I had was access and knowledge to things that could provide support and help and that there's no age limit on that it just really motivated me to keep pursuing that direction of connecting people with what they need to be safest and healthiest what are, what are your thoughts on the stigma of hiv i mean the the stigma is i think the the number one factor in the fact that we still have high infection rates we still have people who are to this day not knowing even that they can access things like PrEP. Yeah. Um, well, what are your thoughts on that? I think anything that allows us to take control of ourselves and our bodies is ultimately always beneficial. And the biggest issue is letting people know that it is safe to talk about, that we inspire each other so much more through our peers and through word of mouth than we do through big campaigns, than we do through uh, mass education. As much as I'd love to see schools talking about, I mean, even just queer sex in sex education, <laughs> I, would, I would love to see that be more recognized and not such a taboo, particularly here in Australia where it's, um, it's 
the, even the idea of safe schools is used as a weapon to bash sensible conversation. Um, to be able to tell your friend, hey, I'm going and getting my, my tests redone this week. Would you like to come with me? You know, when was the last time you got tested? Shall we go together? Is a conversation that so few people have right. or feel comfortable having. Right. Um, and it's a conversation we should all be comfortable to have, whether they're our lovers or not. Like, I take my friends to the clinic. Like, let's all go do a clinic day and then let's go, go, go get a mani-pedi afterwards. Like, why not? Um, <laughs> and why not make it an essential part of your self-care and your community love is yeah. to look after yourself, check in with yourself, and remind your friends and peers that this is an ongoing process of self-awareness, self-care, and community care just by being aware of your status, by, and constantly touching base with the services that have the knowledge and information. Mm -hmm. You know, developments and changes in treatments, in drugs, in ways that, um, you know, some lubes and medications can affect different contraceptives. You know, if we're not allowing ourselves to be in the presence of the professionals who get paid to research and learn, um, we're not keeping ourselves up to date. Yeah. So I just, um, you know, my, me my message is always just talk about it, share it, and don't, don't ever be ashamed of it, ever. I, I worry sometimes that HIV is the last <laughs> major taboo in the, in the gay scene. It's one of the last things that particularly young people really struggle to talk yeah. about. Um, and I think we went through a, a little phase in the last decade where because transmission rates were dropping and because treatment was in, you know, getting better and uh, life expectancy was improving massively and it was no longer a death sentence, if you, you know, um, that we now have young people coming up now who are actually a little too complacent yeah. because they, they didn't go through the, the gripping terror and loss of the epidemic. Yeah. Um, so keeping those conversations rolling and sharing them from peer to peer and generation to generation, um, it, it's, never, it's never a bad time to talk about it. You were mentored in the community. What are your thoughts about mentoring? And it was the biggest honor for me as a young person exploring the kink scene. So uh, about 18, 19, you know, I started attending events, uh, actually 18 like on the dot, <laughs> get in there, start attending events. Um, and within the first year, I, had, I was approached by Lady Raven um, who offered to mentor me. And I remember at the time feeling like it was the greatest honor in the world that, uh, you know, I was running around in cheap goth store bought PVC. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, t a ter terrible paddle and flogger bought at my local adult store. Like, di didn't know any better. But that I, um, I, I seemed to have something that she thought was worth nurturing. And hmm. um, I, I remember feeling just so proud. Um, as I spent my time with Lady Raven and I learned from her and her family, I realized a few things. So firstly, that mentoring is incredible. It, it, it's a gift. It's an absolute gift. And I absolutely did not agree with everything <laughs> that she did or said, okay. um, which was an essential part of being a mentee because I've, I've never, never fit well in anybody's cookie cutter. And that was absolutely fine. And I was let know uh, eventually that, okay, well, there is, if you, if you wish to, you know, be a part of this. This is how we do things. I really respect that. I will absolutely do that while I'm here. And I'll absolutely respect your rules and learn from you. That's not, I don't feel like that's what I will carry on necessarily. Um, but the things that I learned, the opportunity I had to have one on one support and community support and to elevate myself, you know, to, to firstly break myself down a bit, challenge myself, mm -hmm. very quickly learned that I knew nothing, which was really important. <laughs> I yeah. think, um, especially, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a switch, 
but I spent most of my life being dominant and feeling dominant and loving dominance. Um, and as a, as, a, as a young dom in a, in a shiny corset, I remember like sometimes getting to that edge where I'm like, I almost think I'm hot shit right now. Um, so it was wonderful to be smacked back down and like, actually, no, there is a code you need to understand and there is respect you need to show and there are things you need to learn. And um, not to be even allowed the opportunity to endanger anyone else with my ignorance. Yeah. I'm very grateful for, because if I hadn't have had somebody grab me by the shoulder and like, come over here, child, this is how we do. Um, I imagine it would have been incredibly easy to make some very, very silly mistakes. Yeah. And mistakes for us, they, they can be really dangerous sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I needed an adult, and I was very glad that I had one <laughs> who was prepared to, to lead me by the hand and tell me to sit down, shut up when I needed it. And I think we all kind of need that. I think we, you know, when we're shy, we need those people around us to encourage us and inform us and support us and help us develop skills that we can be more confident and proud in. Yes. And when we're too confident and proud, we need people that we love and trust to, um, to temper that a little bit and, and bring us back down to earth and remind us how essential fundamentals are and how important communication is and that these yeah. are skills that you are constantly building on. You don't learn the skill of communication and you're done. You, right. you don't learn the skill of relationships and then every relationship is cruisy from then on out. And you certainly don't learn you know, elements of our craft without really dedicating yourself to, um, to constantly evolving and learning and being better. And, Mentoring, although it was something that I stepped away from after about four or five years. Um, at that point, I was in a long-term relationship and I had a little uh, house sort of building around um, my, my central relationship. Um, did, did my own thing for a while and was able to lead and educate and support in my own way. Um, and after doing that for a few years, realized like, oh, I need to go back to the drawing board actually, because I've kind of gotten to the limit of what I felt comfortable teaching. And I now find myself back in the position where I'm approaching people and asking like, I would love to learn from you. Um, please, you know, would you teach me? And I'm, it's a wonderful experience a second time round to realize, uh, you know, in my early 30s that I, I want to, actively pursue that process again. Fascinating. But you worked as a pro-dom for a while. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that was, um, I was alongside Lady Raven. Um, she kept me on my toes for the first year of, of mentoring. Um, I was able to assist her in our dungeon. So she had, a, she had a private dungeon that she operated out of. She also helped me build my dungeon um, in a central location in, in Hastings. Uh, it was an incredible venue. I'm still, still wistful about it now. It was in a three-story uh, nightclub in Hastings, and they, the, when the owners changed over, they allowed me to convert the ground floor, uh, the basement floor, into a dungeon. But Hastings is a seaside town, and historically it's an old smuggling town. Oh. And there's loads of caves and tunnels that run all the way under the, the town. And a lot of them pop up underneath old bars and clubs where they used to like smuggle barrels in. Uh. So the basement of this club was an entirely man-made sandstone cave. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so I, I turned a sandstone cave into a dungeon, um, which was glory. Like such a thing will never happen again because you really need all the stars to align for that to occur. Um, and it was beautiful and atmospheric and it felt a bit like a tourist attraction, but I loved it. Um, everything about it was perfect except a sandstone floor and high heels are just the worst idea. Oh. The worst idea. In one of my early pro dom sessions, I'm doing a, a sensory deprivation scene. So I've uh, mummified the client and they're hooded, they got noise cancelling headphones on got them in bondage, and I'm like, I'm just going to go sit over there for five minutes, put my feet up, read a magazine, let them enjoy the 
experience. Um, and I, I tripped ass over to um, oh. <laughs> on the floor. I didn't want to shout too loudly for my assistant who was out the front door because I didn't want to ruin the scene for the client. <laughs> but I did. I, I got a I got a nine inch heel caught in the stone floor, twisted my ankle, and oh. I'm in a long line corset as well. So I just went over like <laughs> chopped tree, um, smacked my face on the ground. Oh, I was like, oh, I'm the most glamorous and sexy person in the world right now. <laughs> so I, I did like knowing that they could hear me. I was kind of like army crawled my way over to my couch, like propped myself up, I'm like, ugh, got my makeup out, touched up the little scab that was forming, <laughs> and ended that session as quickly as I could without them. I think I got away with it, but I still to this day do not actually know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, uh, through that process, through the building the dungeon, and working with Lady Raven, um, it, it, really, it really took me to school. Um, the difference in working as a professional to pursuing your own and your partner's uh, desires and exploring. Sure. With a client, you don't have the opportunity to build the trust that deserves to be there. Yes. Um, and it took me a little while to realize that I actually felt quite uncomfortable with that situation. I wanted to be able to trust that they could communicate with me, not just through safe words, but also yeah. be able to tell me what they like and don't like how things feel. And building that comfort of communication isn't something that happens naturally yeah. and in an instant for most people. So I found myself having to get more and more explicit and stricter with absolutely how I expected people to communicate and exactly how. And although that was helpful in learning how to lead people in communication, it never really eased my sense of what if this person actually goes nonverbal and I can't pick their tells? What if this person yeah. is uncomfortable but is embarrassed or has the sunk cost fallacy where because they paid for something and they don't like it, they can't stop it? I just became more and more aware of the complexity as, as time went on. Um, I did get to do some amazing things that I would never have personally pursued though. Um, I do like the confidence that some people have when they know they're paying for a service. They no longer have any qualms at just mm -hmm. telling you exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. And some people are so incredibly specific. <laughs> but I had so many questions I wanted to ask and realized that wasn't really what I was there for. I wasn't there to be like, but why do you want to be interrogated and you know, simulate having your penis chopped off? <laughs> like, why is that a thing for you? I'd love to know, but obviously you don't really get yeah. that opportunity. So just letting these fascinating uh, opportunities kind of just pass by in the night and I'll <laughs> indulge them once I've asked the questions I need to. But um, I, I liked that there was some mystery, but uh, I wish I had found a way to reconcile my concerns about finding the line between giving people what they deserve and want and have engaged services for and maintaining my own comfort, my own boundaries, and mm -hmm. being able to understand, communicate, and respect their boundaries. Uh, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't the most comfortable for me. I, I loved, I mean, I loved it as a job. Didn't feel like I was developing in it after a while, okay. though. Um, but what it did give me the opportunity to do is having had this one floor of this place converted was to approach the owner of the rest of the venue and be like, so do you want to give it to me a couple nights a month, the whole thing, and we can throw some shindigs. Um, and I ended up running the largest club in my area oh. for a number of years out of there with the support of the owners. Um, and it was, it functioned as a strip club, so it had the best licenses of anywhere in town. <laughs> and the fact that the owners were comfortable and happy, and lifestylers themselves were comfortable enough to say, girls, take the weekend off. Feel free to come back if you want and play, but it's no longer a work weekend. Okay. And um, <clears throat> yeah, that's when I started the club Guilty Pleasures and ran Guilty Pleasures for a number of years with a huge team um, of supporters, you know my partner at the time and now our community around us are able to run a, a three floor extravaganza and let people come together as a community. 
And as soon as I realized that that's what I was doing, it wasn't just about throwing a party, it was about bringing people together in, in an area that didn't have public events. Sure. I was realizing like, oh, well, I can tie these things together. Why don't I contact people I've worked with in the past? The Terence Higgins Trust, who are a, a HIV support trust in England. They would bring down their bowls of condoms and information to talk to our clients. And then I contacted projects I used to work for, like Pulse, and they would bring a rack of, you know, how to access services. And they're putting out leaflets about what health facilities were supportive to the community. And that was really great. And I started bringing in people to do demonstrations and teach classes and Q and A's and realized that actually, it's not just about bringing community together, it's about bringing people together, getting them talking, sharing knowledge, sharing information, sharing stories. And that felt like, at the time, the best culmination of all the things that I'd worked on already and how to bring them together. But what advice have you for people who are new to the community? Always ask questions, always. Um, if you're irritating, someone will tell you, don't worry about it. <laughs> There are so many people who will willingly share their knowledge, their experience, yeah. their time. Yeah. And obviously, you know, 101, the first thing we all learn is about how to ask, right? And how to accept and know and how to appreciate other people's uh, boundaries. So asking for somebody's help, for somebody's encouragement, for somebody's uh, knowledge, um, these are things that practicing how to do in a social environment actually benefits the rest of our yeah. community life, right? So get involved. Um, community is a word that is used a lot and sometimes it means that close-knit, unified um, family that we, we hope for. And sometimes it's used very amorphously to be, you know, places where kinky folk gather and doesn't necessarily bring us all together and doesn't, um, but we're the opportunity to do that. We're the, yeah. we're the glue. And there are always going to be people who are more visible. And that's because we make ourselves visible to be flags and beacons for other people to come towards because we can point them in the right directions, even if yeah. we're not the right people ourselves. You know, it's, it's what you do by collecting knowledge and information. It's what, um, Renee at Notbound does by bringing people together and putting on events that share knowledge. It's, if you look for the people shouting the loudest and waving our flags and showing us, showing us all where there is a safe place to communicate, that's where you'll find people who can help direct and guide and educate. Um, and I've always been proud to be one of the people that puts my hand up and um, you know, does a, does a silly song and dance about it and lets everybody know where I am because I, I want to share the best things about my life with anybody who wants to listen. What's the biggest misconception about you? I, I think that's changed recently, actually. Once upon a time, I think people thought that I was uh, intimidating and I've never felt per personally intimidating unless, you know, I'm very specifically in that moment with an individual or three. Um, generally, I find myself to be a bit of a, a bit of a dork and a complete fool. Um, but I've been told that I'm scary and intimidating um, and unapproachable. So I think that's that's generally the biggest misconception is that I I, I don't want to talk and share constantly. Uh. I, I know that particularly when I perform as well. So I'm a, you know, I've lived with um, depression, anxiety most of my life, and being a solid part of a community really is my my savior. Is my my way through that mud is to know that I am one amongst many people who all have my back, and I as I have theirs, and that that keeps me confident and going and getting up in the morning. Um, but as somebody who does have anxiety and depression, I know that often I will rock up to an event or a gig and before it starts, I might be completely silent. Either I'm running through my concepts or I'm doing last minute checks, whatever. And I apparently, I, I mean, I don't have resting bitch face. I have resting kind of sad, mad face. Wow. Like I look like really like I'm not having a good time. And it's just my thinking face. <laughs> um, but if I'm quiet and have a stern face on, I think people think that I'm, I'm very detached uh, and not there to be um, 
friendly and I, I just I would welcome anybody to ask me anything in fact that's why I started my podcast King Clinic was with the with the tagline ask me anything because I really think that people need to learn that they can always ask the question like okay you might not want to ask your family you might not want to ask your friends there might you know particularly around kinks and fetishes and BDSM like, okay choose your audience maybe I've yeah. been a little little carefree with it over the years and just told everyone <laughs> but choose your audience and sometimes people don't know who to who's this, that safe person or where that safe community is and so I've, I wanted to put up a a new medium for people to be able just to reach out with their questions either in person or anonymously can't speak um, and say you can ask me anything that is kink, BDSM, leather related and either I or the people I think are more equipped to answer your question I will reach out to them on your behalf and we'll get you the answers for any question that you have relating mm -hmm. to kink because everybody deserves access to resources knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Well said, Faustus, I would like to thank you so very much for being part of Inside Leather History and Fireside Chat. Thank you so much for having me.